Our next speaker is Jill Mason Miller, the president of Envision Strategies. And I got to know Jill, and I think it was maybe two or three years ago, uh, I asked a colleague of mine that's the head of commercial lending for a large bank here in Ohio, I said, who do you use to mentor and teach your top performers to be better at selling? Well, without hesitation, he said, Jill Mason Miller. So I called Jill and we met, and I too was very impressed with her knowledge and her passion for helping professionals become better at selling services. Her business, Envision Strategies, is a consulting firm that's been making sales, service, and leadership happen for over a decade for a variety of progressive, high-growth businesses. Envision's clients have spanned the spectrum from Fortune 100 companies to small businesses. Jill's experience is derived directly from her background in sales, customer service, marketing, financial services, manufacturing, and distribution. At ss g we've worked with Jill with great success to enhance the sales process for many ss g professionals. Today, Jill will share with us some cutting-edge thinking on maximizing sales team performance. So please help me welcome Jill Mason Miller. Good afternoon. So when you think about this picture in front of you from Larry Goddard, it's pretty. When I think of it, I think of CEOs love to do this stuff, right? It's the sexy stuff. It's about strategy, downhill rides, sweet spots, all the things that you like to do when you hit that president's level. When you think about these pieces, the hard part is, I would argue that you've got the hot sports car, and that's only half the battle. Having the hot sports car is great, but if it sits in your driveway and rusts away because you don't have the keys, you're going to have a problem. So strategy when you think about it, without execution is like having a Porsche and not having the keys to drive it. My topic is the ugly, gritty topic that people don't like to hang out with. But today, let's take a look at what you need to do in your seat to make those things happen. So first of all, this word, execution, what is it? In my mind, execution is something that's part of your job. And I will tell you, I've had hundreds of CEOs tell me, I like to work on the business versus in the business. And if you are one of those gals or guys, the challenge is, guess what? Unless you have a perfectly humming along organization, you have to get down and dirty and do this work. So what does it take? One, execution has to be part of your strategy, right? Two. It has to be part of your culture. And three, it's got to take your people, your ops, tie it all together, and make it happen. It's about you having a realistic perspective of everybody in your company. And unless you are perfect, you, my friend, have to be in the business, not just on the business. So as we think about execution, how many of you in the room, raise your hand, think your, fat, your, your company is perfect at it? Show of hands. How many of you think you could use a little help? Show of hands. Why is that? Why is it so hard? Talk to me. Why is it so hard? I know some of you, and I'm not afraid to call on you. Why is it so hard? Don Taylor, why is execution so hard? You know I was going there first. People, do they always do what you want, Mr. Taylor? Not often. All right, good. Tony, why is it so hard to execute? Tony, tap. What do you got for me? Why is it so hard? Tell me. He's laughing and he's red. Dave Laser, help him out. People, again, the people part. All right. When you think about execution as a company, there's a number of reasons we do not do well. The first one, you all actually have to understand how things get done. And I would tell you that you don't know everything. 
So whether you're the ex-CFO, you work through ops, you were the manufacturing guy, I would argue that you probably don't know all of it. So you've got to be good at everything. I would also argue you have to have a plan and process, and not just the pretty stuff. How many of you have a business plan? That's a great start. The hard part is then you have to have all the things underneath it that help you in that strategy. Then you have to have an unwavering commitment to make it happen. Last things I would tell you about execution is how many of you get attracted to the shiny penny? You know, if you saw the movie Up, it's like squirrel. It's when you get attracted to those things that are more new and exciting than what's in your day to day. Most leaders are good at the ideas. The hard part about that is you have to like the routine, and that's not easy. So as we talk about execution, let's talk a little bit about what this means for sales. So on the sales side, I'm going to share a story. I have a good friend, someone I consider a friend, who is a CEO sitting in this room. And I met him a number of years ago. Now, first of all, this is a guy that could print money in his company. Every day, business pouring in, company doubling, tripling, growing all the time. But he was in a recession-sensitive company. What do you think happened a few years ago? Stops, right? A few years ago, all of a sudden, recession hits. He has questions. Who's the first department he wants to go to when sales slow down? Business development, right? Marketing. So he goes and he asks really smart questions. Who are we calling on? Who's our target market? Who is the downhill ride? What did, we, what did we do last week? What did we do last quarter? What are you all planning on doing tomorrow? And what do you think he had staring at him in the face? Some blank stares. Sales execution is even harder than corporate execution for a number of reasons. Let's talk about it. Is sales process tribal knowledge in your company? What does that mean? That means that your salespeople get a budget every year and a pat on the butt, and they go off to work. And you have no idea what they really do when they're out there. Sales execution is hard because, first of all, we don't always know the customer and what they're thinking. On top of that, you don't have a sales process because you're using somebody else's. Or maybe you have a business plan, but you haven't defined what would happen. Maybe it's because they don't have anything except for an activity goal and a sales number. Worse yet, have you ever met a salesperson that had ego? I don't really think, we're not too bad, right? Salespeople have ego, and what we worry about is that your best ones will quit if you start telling them what to do. Worse yet, you start to worry that if you change things for your customers, they will leave. And last but not least, that you don't have the structure, the channel, the compensation, the training, and the tools to make it happen. So, what to do with this? Larry started this on strategy. What I hope to deliver to you, and I hope to have some questions, are four things that I think you need to do to make sure that sales execution happens. So as we look at these four buckets, we're going to move and groove and talk about each. First one, under execution, under these pieces, is this marketing research segmentation piece. When you think about this piece, why don't you do it? Why don't you do enough of it? First of all, how many of you think you do enough market research, segmentation, and analysis? Why don't you do it? Come on. You think, are you guys actually know-it-alls out there? I can't even believe that, right? Yes, one of it is you, you know it, or you think you know it, or you knew it when? Five years ago. So one of the things that makes research and this investment so hard is we think we know it. What else does it take? Mr. Hickey, what does it take? A little money, which means you have to want to buy the data, hire the experts, do the surveys, do the pilot test before you launch and learn. Not the easiest thing to do. So let's talk about what this takes here. First of all, you should have a non-negotiable for your company that you better go out and figure out how people buy, why they buy, 
and you need to do it on a regular basis. You need to invest the money, because all those excuses about money and time are gone. The internet helps us. We can do research quickly. You need to test those markets. You need to find the downhill ride. Secondly, when you think about what you have in your business, is how many of you have marketing and sales separated? Marketing, marketing are like the very cashmere kind of folks in your organization. Your salespeople look like me. We are a plaid pants and group. So what happens there is you have marketing and sales, and both of them are trying to figure out what you want us to do. Marketing is like, wait a second, what do we do? We're doing blogs and tweets, and our sales guys are making calls, and we're saying different things. So one of the things research, analysis, and segmentation does is it pulls the cashmere and the plaid pants together, and it says, guess what? We need to figure out who does what and how we make things happen, and we need to know what the roles are to do that. When you do this piece well, you are set up for all the right things. Let's move on. In our mix, we have our second step, which is one of my absolute favorites, and I would argue that very few of you have it. It's called a touch plan. So you've got a business plan, and I commend you for having it. I bet most of you have a vision. I would guess you have values. I would guess you have these beautifully, eloquently written strategies. The touch plan is not that. The touch plan is when you look at your organization and you say, we are siloed, and we are all on an island. And sometimes you feel this way. You have marketing, you have sales, you have business development, you have management, you have operations, you have admin, and nobody talks to each other. And they're not all singing from the same song sheet. Everybody in your organization has to understand how to grow business. You need to connect the dots. So here's what a touch plan is. It is a requirement with my clients to have this, is you need to have a detailed 12 to 18 month plan that says exactly, exactly how you are gonna proactively touch your customers, prospects, and influencers. How easy is that to implement? Not easy, because you know what you have to do? You have to go through some steps to make that happen. First of all, you have to get everybody in the same room, which means HR, marketing, sales, you have to all figure out how are we gonna engage with our clients. Then after you have that piece, you gotta move that into your plan. So I'm gonna give you a nine step process to do that. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on these buckets, but we're gonna talk about them. Growth strategy came from your research, your strategic plan. All you did was figure out what that was, kick off your touch plan. Second thing that you do is you go to that research and you say, okay, who's our target market? Who is our downhill ride? Once you've laid that out, you decide which targets are a priority, and I'm gonna ask you to take your system and tag everybody, A, B, C, D, influencer, prospect, customer, vendor, media. And now you've got everybody in your system laid out. Once you do that piece, then you have to set some goals, because we all get to have goals. We need to know what's happening with marketing, what's happening with sales. Then you decide what your touch tools are. Touch tools are everything that you're gonna do to get in front of those people. Educational events, blogs, tweets, emails, salespeople calling, leaders calling, training events. And you're gonna define exactly what those are. And then you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a contact plan. And it's gonna say, guess what? This is my table A, and I'm gonna to touch them 13 times this year. Four emails, four sales calls, two leader calls, and a couple other blog pieces we're gonna get them involved with. When you decide the contact plan, you've basically said, as an organization, we have a non-negotiable. That's our contact plan for our A's, B's, and C's. Once you finish that, you're gonna step back and we're gonna create a calendar of who's doing what. And then you're going to decide what it's gonna cost you. And then at the beginning of that year or that plan, you're all gonna agree exactly what's gonna happen and what you're gonna spend. This, my friends, keeps you out of just inconsistent marketing. Last but not least, you're gonna go ahead and use your CRM, Dynamic, Salesforce, whatever it might be, Oracle, 
you're gonna make sure that everything's loaded so that nobody skips out. You can't have a sales guy that makes one call today, then doesn't call him for eight months. You can't have a marketing department that sometimes executes when they're not busy doing other things. And you're gonna sit back and you're gonna have some fun managing that process. Touch plan, you have to have it. One of your sponsors, First Merit, Gene Gottfried, has that plan, I encourage you to talk to him as you work through it. Don Taylor has that plan, what a smart thing to do. Next piece, you gotta have besides a touch plan, or let me wrap touch plan. What does touch plan ensure? It ensures that you can go home at night, not worry about sales and marketing, because that you will have consistent, valuable interaction with prospects, customers, influencers, and you will be able to pull up your little tablet and you'll be able to see exactly what's happening so there's no surprises. Third tool, third area to focus on today in execution is sales structure. So when we think of sales structure, let's talk about these, these little areas that come together for you. First of all, how should you structure your sales and marketing team? Two, what is your sales process? I'm gonna show you a client's sales process with their permission so you can take a look at it. Third, you figure out how you're gonna train this. Fourth, you're gonna talk about the tools, and last but not least, you're gonna figure out how to incent people to do what you need them to do. Let's take, let's take the first left side there, let's talk about channel. In channel, you and I know that how we go to market has changed in some ways. You know there are field people, there are outside people, there are inside people, and besides people, there are lead gens and business development choices. There's all kinds of things that you can do in your structure if you have a vision for how it's all gonna execute with the client. Key is, you have to know the customer journey, you have to know how they become aware and how they buy, and then you have to match your structure up to the process and the customer. The hard part here is customers change and all of a sudden you have an old structure and you have gotta kind of reinvent that piece. Next thing that you need to do after sales channel is you need to talk about your sales process. I am passionate about sales. I love sales. It's a great thing when you have a process. Sometimes you believe it's just the person you hire. To me, that's the maverick artist that kind of slides in, does a bunch of crazy stuff and people say yes and you figure, I don't know what to do there, he just makes it happen. You and I both know that's not repeatable. So your sales process is a way for you to say, here's how we go to business, how we find prospects, how we find clients, how we service them, and how we plan our marketing and sales. Suprema, I don't know if you know Suprema for any of you gritty folks that know the roofing industry. Suprema is a $3 billion company out of Paris. Their headquarters is in Wadsworth, Ohio. It's a great organization. So with their permission, I'm just gonna show you the front page of their process. No need to get caught up in the nitty gritty. Let me just show you what it looks like though. Their sales process has all their steps. Now, if you know Suprema, their motto, their brand is about the mammoth. So this says, be mammoth. These are the six steps that they defined with their sales team and their managers by, and looking at their client research that talks about how Suprema will go to market. It's not Dale Carnegie, it's not Sandler, it's not any of that, it's theirs. It's their lingo. And their salespeople created it with their marketing team and their management team and some external research. This process, whether it's five steps, six steps, eight steps, is who they are. So let me give you just two examples in this little graphic that might help you. So the first step they have there, take charge and plan. You'll see in there, has a 12 month calling plan. Guess what? When they wrote that in there, every one of their 1600, 1600 folks, they end up with that plan. It says maintain customer relationship plans. They have them, they're online, they work with them. Next piece I'll highlight is they have recruiting general contractors and roofing contractors. Very specific to them, it's part of their process. In this process, they have a 28-page white paper that goes behind it. 
And that is what a salesperson lives into. Their whole company uses the language. It's in their performance reviews. When they hire somebody, they interview to it. They live this process. So the question for you is, do you have yours that tightened up? Once you have the process, and we're close to questions, so think about your questions. I'm not letting you go without a few questions is then they need to work on the thing that we heard over here from Mr. Taylor is a challenge and Mr. Laser, which is what do we do with all these people, right? These people are not doing what I want them to do, right? When you think about the people side, with all the other things set up, you're in good shape. So thinking about the people and the tools, you've got to go to the next level. So then you create the tools around your sales process. So these are different things you might have. So What's our negotiating planner? What's our relationship plan? What's our 12-month calling plan? What tools do we need to recruit contractors? You create those tools. Once you have the tools through and done, you come up with your comp structure and your training. So what are all those things focused on? They're focused on that sales process we just came up with in all the same lingo. Last piece of my presentation today is on the fourth bucket that we need to talk about. That fourth bucket is about accountability. So in execution, someone has to be accountable. Who do you think that is? Who's accountable? I'm thinking that's you. When you think about accountability in sales growth, I go back to what Larry said earlier. He said you can't blame your salesperson. Sometimes you can, depends on what they're doing. But I would argue the ultimate accountability for growth, you know this because you're the one that's writing the checks. You invested in the business, it's your heart and soul, right? The ultimate accountability is you. So when we focus that accountability on sales, on you owning it, there's some things that you gotta think about here. And I'm sure you think about getting it done. I'm sure you think about how you make that happen. But realize this, if the CEO doesn't execute, nobody else will. It's just like if your CEO doesn't use the CRM, nobody else does. If the CEO can't make sales calls, nobody else will as well. If your CEO doesn't follow the sales process, it's never gonna happen. So you have to be that best salesperson. Here's the accountability pieces. First one, you have to have management protocol around sales. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have a client that they actually have a management protocol around what they do weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually, and all the pieces that they do to reevaluate and manage their process. Two, you have to hire the right people. When you have that sales process defined, do not get lured by the potential. How many of you have somebody in your office right now that they don't do great, and then all of a sudden they get some sale and you keep them? And I always have a good friend of mine that says, you know, even the blind squirrel finds a nut if they just keep looking. You can't get lured by potential. You've got to hire the right people. Then you have to onboard them. And onboarding is not a one-day agenda or a week. Onboarding for a salesperson is typically about a year, which means you in that year got to be doing a lot of things that happen. Last couple things. You've got to have sales management tools and systems so that those guys are not your tribal knowledge people. Because if they are, you're never going to know what's going on with them. They'll still do whatever they want to do. And last but not least, you have to be accountable for deal innovation. One of the best things a sales manager does and a leader is figure out how do we get deals done faster? Because every deal doesn't fit into the beautiful box. So when you think about the sexy stuff, the strategy. I would argue that that gets you halfway there. Halfway there. The hard part about that, though, is that you need all these four things to make it happen. So when you've got your sweet spot, you got your growth engine, now you're going to do the hard work, the heavy lifting. Research, analysis, segmentations. Touch plan. Detailing out in a year or 18 months exactly how you're going to touch your customers, prospects, influencers, having that in a document that marketing, sales, service, everybody agrees to, budgeting and calendaring around it, 
defining your sales process with your sales team, getting that in place, comp, training, all that good stuff, and then having the accountability to follow through. When you do those things, I believe that you get the keys to the car. You got the car ready, that's your business plan. It's the reason you're sitting here. You were invited because you're a successful CEO. It's getting the ability to drive that car that makes it so fun. So, what questions can I answer? Any questions? Yes, yeah, we're going in the back and then we're coming right up front. Yes, sir. Um, Daniel, <coughs> excuse me, Daniel Pink has a book out called Drive. Love it. That indicates that uh, uh, financial incentives might actually work against you in motivating people. What's your perspective of that, on that in the context of sales? First of all, that is a great book, and my other assignment for you these days would be his last book that just came out, right, is to sell as human. And when you read that and you get the research, you'll be amazed at how it changes you. There's not many good sales books out there. That one's good, and the Challenger Sale is the best book going. Anyway, let's go to Daniel Pink. So Daniel Pink says that business is not doing what science knows, right? Science says to us, that what, what motivates us now, especially Y generation, you guys have kids, you know it's hard to motivate them. I have too, it's crazy. When you think about how we're motivated, we're motivated by three things. We're motivated by right control, we want control, autonomy. Which, how many of you have salespeople that would like you to leave them alone? All of them, right? Just leave me alone, I'll do better without you here, right? So we want autonomy. We also want mastery, so we want to feel like we are the best at something. And the third piece of that book is that we want to feel like we're giving back to the greater good. And I think you can thank us in the room that have hit that age where we want to give back and Y generation for being inherently that way. So here's what I would say to that. First of all, money is not necessarily a motivator. It's a demotivator, though, if you don't have it. So if you are in the line of paying people fairly and sending the right behaviors, I think compensation still pushes salespeople because they strive to make some money. But I would argue, smart question, that you have to find a way to give them some autonomy and control. You need to make them feel like they are great at what they do, and you need to train them to make them feel that way. Because a lot of us have salespeople like me. I'm old. I got gray hair. So what happens is I want to feel like I'm still relevant. You've got to make them feel that way. And then the third piece I would say to that is, this whole social responsibility, which is part of that book, is you have to find a way for them to feel like when they're in a sales or a marketing role, they're doing something for the greater good. So motivation, great book to read. I'm glad you brought it up. I think it's both. I think you got to pay them enough. You got to make them hungry and give them some other pieces. But if you don't have those three things, you're done, right? You're never going to get their heart and soul. Did that help a little? Sorry, it uh, just happened to be a book that I like to read. Question, sir. So, if you're coming to have limited resources, right? There's so many good questions in that. So, first question is if your company has limited resources, how do you get a touch plan done anyway? So I think part of it would be, first of all, you should try. On the touch plan piece, I would take that stat with that little blueprint I gave you in your book, and I would start clicking off those boxes, right? So what's our downhill ride? Who's our target market? And there's a lot of ways to quantify a market um, without doing all the research, especially if you're looking at things you can find online. I think that you have to kind of draw a line in the sand and figure out, what would I do with these folks if I had all the money in the world? Figure out what the touch plan would look like. And then you know what you do when you put that budget and that calendar together? Start putting some metrics into, if I get this, I'll do more. If I get this, I'll do more. The touch plan piece is usually not the expensive piece money-wise. 